Hello everybody and welcome to JTV. Well, I'm thrilled to be joined by rabbi, historian, writer, um, Ken Spiro, who's joining us from Jerusalem, uh, Israel right now. Um, what I love about uh, Rabbi Ken Spiro is that he has a pretty rare and unique ability to uh, look at history and talk about history, but, but through, through a Torah lens. And um, that's so important right now that we do that so we can actually make sense of, of the world around us. I can recommend a number of books that he's written that you should check, one of the, check out. One of the most important ones, Crash Course on Jewish History, which you can uh, find online for sure. Um, Rabbi, the first thing to ask you is, how are you doing? You know, you're in the, the heart of it all right now. How are you doing from, from Israel? Yeah, well, it, two weeks ago, a little more than two weeks now, was very traumatic. I've been in Israel for over 40 years, and that was the worst day, the day after when everything was coming out, the level of barbarity and the sheer number of people killed and kidnapped in a teeny country. Everyone's comparing it to, you know, Israel's Pearl Harbor, Israel's 9-11, but on a, on a much bigger scale because of the small size of the population. Proportionally, it's at least 40 9-11s for Israel in terms of the number of people killed. At least, no, it's the equivalent of, of I think, of, I think it was, or 20 9-11s, the equivalent of 40, 40 to 45,000 Americans dying in a terrorist attack and then thousands being taken hostage. So that was very traumatic. People were really on edge. I see the first couple of days after the country was literally in shock. And, you know, people are very angry and everyone's galvanized and the army mobilized. But people are, are, you see people pulling out. It's not the, I've been through many wars here. You know, is, Israelis are pretty, you know, used to missile attacks. We actually underreact to them when sirens go off. But that, the, what, what happened in Gaza is, was truly traumatic. But I see that people are, life is sort of returning to normal. It's going to take a very long time for that to happen. Um, and people are just waiting for the next, you know, basically the ground invasion because everyone is unified in recognizing that that's it. No more. We've done many times in the past. Uh, you know, we we they fire missiles, we blow up some stuff, and after a few days, there's a ceasefire and things return to sort of uh, normal quiet. But this time, everyone realizes, as any country would recognize, that no country would tolerate this blatant act of war and terrorism, and not and they have, they have to be destroyed. So Israel, everyone's just waiting here for the the ground invasion, which is also scary because it's they've fortified themselves in really well, and that's going to be unfortunately. I hope not, but but costly, time consuming, and very, very difficult. And what do you think the new normal will look like post that? Well, that depends on how, if the world steps in and what we do with Gaza. Israel doesn't want to reoccupy Gaza. We gave it to them in 2005 so they could hopefully turn, it could have been paradise, you know, had they had they not immediately turned into a terrorist state in whose very charter it calls for the, the death and destruction of the Jewish people in the state of Israel. You know, then you have to fortify the border and kind of, keep them separate, but it could have been a beautiful beach with in, incredible, you know, business and, and cooperation and, 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 uh, factories. And it would, have, it would have been, a could have been a model. Unfortunately, it turned into an absolute disaster. This is what happens when you let maniacal evil terrorists run a piece of real estate and there are neighbors. Right. So when they are gotten rid of, if things return to some normal, more normal situation, it will be a great relief for Israel, especially the communities in the South that no longer have to live under the threat of missiles being shot at them for no reason. And who do you think will end up running Gaza? Well, that's the question. This is going to be the true test of the world now. What will happen? It can't be Israel. It'd be great if some Arab states would agree to do it. Some coalition of international forces would sort of like a Marshall Plan for Gaza reconstruction, but creating a stable government. And these people have been raised. People don't appreciate in the West. These people are raised to hate. Is it you know people talk about the innocent civilians of Gaza, but they elected Hamas in 2006, and the vast majority of them support Hamas. And when when these attacks were going on, you could just see the videos of everyone cheering as you know they're slaughtering, raping, and doing horrible things to Israelis and handing out candies and having like a big party to celebrate. And they knew exactly what was going to happen. So, mm. so that mentality is so seeped into the consciousness of the population that they have to be weaned off of that also. That's, a, but there's definitely hope. There's always hope. Depends on what the people of Gaza decide to do. If they decide to get it right the next time. Right. So I'd like to now really zoom out 
you know, or, or, or zoom backwards uh, in history, um, because you have a bunch of talks that talk about current events in light of what the Torah writes about the genesis of many of the nations of the world. And you talk, you have a whole class that talks about um, Isaac and Ishmael, uh, the, the forefather of one of the forefathers of the Jewish people and a forefather of really the Arab world. Um, could you talk us through that and perhaps shed light on current events fr from the perspective of this, this history? So Ollie, that's a really great question. And to, to understand that, you have to kind of peel off some layers of the onion, so to speak, the outer layers being the geopolitical realities. Then you go back to further history, the Arab-Israeli conflict and the Arab world's inability to tolerate a Jewish state historically. But the real deepest understanding goes all the way back to the Bible and the beginnings in the book of Genesis. That's how Judaism understands what's really going on in the deepest psychological spiritual level of a conflict or a rivalry because if you know the origins of that of the arab of islam we, we we kind of like conflate arabs and islam because islam begins amongst the arabic speaking people of the arabian peninsula 1300 years ago but today the majority of muslims 70 percent are not arabs but islam is a product of that arab mind and that original relationship and we know that we say this in our sources in judaism and the arab world agrees with this it's in the quran that they're basically our brother from another mother abraham's first wife sarah who is our grandma the jewish people is barren till a very late age so to give abraham biological offspring she gives abraham a second wife something that we don't do today it's called polygamy and then that second wife is a woman named Hagar, who is actually the daughter of Pharaoh, one of the gifts that Abraham gets when he goes to Egypt during a famine is one of Pharaoh's daughters named Hagar. And from that relationship will come a boy whose name is Yishmael or Ishmael. And Ishmael, therefore, is the firstborn son of Abraham. Then we know supernaturally, this is the whole story of the Jewish people, the creation and perpetuation of the Jewish people from its very inception until today is a violation of all the normal laws of history. But Sarah gives birth at a very old age to Isaac. And God says, you know, through Isaac, he says to Abraham, your name will be called. And Isaac gives birth to has Jacob, has his son, and Jacob has 12 sons who make the 12 tribes. The Jewish people are from that lineage. So they are literally our brother from another mother. But they're also the firstborn which means that the, the family business, monotheism.org, .com, .edu, .whatever, should have really come through Yishmael, but he is bypassed. That's a whole interesting discussion. He doesn't have the right stuff because his mother's not Sarah. It's interesting in Judaism, the woman makes you Jewish because the essence of who you are comes from the mother, not the father. So, but he, you can be sure that he feels, this is my own personal take, but he feels, and it's, there's definitely rabbinic sources that point to this, that he feels slighted that he was bypassed by his younger brother. It's not fair. I'm a dedicated monotheist at a time when there was no monotheist in the world except Abraham's immediate family. And we say on the deepest level, that's what's been bothering him since then. It's not fair. I'm, I'm from, as they say in, in, in yeshiva language, I'm a religious guy. So much of what is going on today on the deepest level is basically a contest of who can up who and who can be more dedicated to God. From the Jewish perspective, we would say that the issue with Islam is they don't have our Bible. They just have our, our very strict conception of monotheism, similar to Judaism. But without the values and the vision that comes from the Bible, they have a slightly different, they have a very different version of that, which tends to make Islam often quite extreme and fanatical in its view of monotheism or it can be hijacked in that direction historically for sure and we would say and i see this that um what islam has done and a lot of what islam does a lot of the commandments of islam are based on judaism you know the statement of one god which is the essential statement of judaism the essential statement of islam you know the the dietary laws there's so many different things that are similar uh, but everything that islam has done that has come from Judaism because there wouldn't be Islam without Judaism, historically, theologically, in every way it comes after Judaism, a long way after, is basically an attempt on a certain level to kind of show that they're more dedicated. We say, you know, here is the Lord our God, the Lord is one. They say, La ila ala wa Muhammad Rasul Allah. there is no God but God and Muhammad is his messenger. We pray three times, so they pray five times. We bow at the waist when we pray. They bow all the way down on the ground to the floor. We wash our hands before we pray. They wash their hands and their feet. 
you know, we pray towards Jerusalem, they pray towards Mecca, we, we fast on one day on Yom Kippur, they fast 30 days on Ramadan, we have this idea of a pilgrimage holiday to Jerusalem, they have the idea of Hajj, you know, it goes on and on. We have this idea of dressing modestly, they take it to extremes. You go to Islamic countries and the women are completely covered up. You know, we taught the world dying for your beliefs, they take it to the extreme of let's blow up other people for our beliefs. So it's, it's, it's sort of like this rivalry of who can show that they are more dedicated to God. And it can come out very, it has historically in many periods of time, like we just saw now, uh, come out very harshly and very violently. But that we say is the deepest, that's the deepest rivalry going on that it's Maimonides, the great medieval Jewish scholar, when writing to the Jews of Yemen a thousand years ago, who were undergoing forced conversion, he said, don't let the might of the Arabs and everything, you know, like totally blow you away. It's just God's way of testing to show that you can be dedicated to God in the proper way. You know, it's like to show that you got to bring out from the Jewish perspective, what's the right way to give God a good name and to behave in a way that is godlike in the world and be a proper role model. Hmm. And can you talk to us a bit about the, sp the specific names of Israel and Ishmael and what they mean and what they what they sort of symbolize? Right. So it's interesting that this, this parallels in that stories in Genesis of Ishmael, when Hagar is pregnant, you know, an angel appears and says, you're going to conceive and give birth uh, to a boy, which is good because she can already send out the messaging for what color of baby clothes to buy before the birth. And she says his name will be Ishmael, which is one of the rare examples of God naming a kid. And Ishmael means God hears. God listens to him. And, and, the same thing will happen to Isaac, by the way. And Isaac actually comes from the word laughter. It's not the same. It doesn't have the same God thing in there as Ishmael's name. And the rabbis have kind of gone wild throughout history on the name Ishmael and all the things it tells us. It says because he's a child of Abraham, because he has God's name in his name, because he was circumcised, he has, as we say in protectia, God listens to him. He has a relationship with God. He's a dedicated monotheist. He gets certain benefits. He may have been bypassed, but he has certain merits. There's a whole idea, by the way, that since he's circumcised at 13 years old, when Isaac is circumcised, Isaac is circumcised at eight days old. The Jewish custom is eight days old. The Islamic custom is supposed to be 13, although as far as I know, I've never met a Muslim who does it to a 13-year-old. They have all other combinations of doing it in different ways. But there's a famous Midrash, a piece of rabbinic story, when Isaac and Ishmael are basically arguing over who's more dedicated. And Ishmael, who has God's name and his name, says, I'm the man. You got circumcised at eight days old. You didn't even know what's happening to you. I got it at 13. Who's more dedicated? And Isaac says, you, you're trying to impress me with that? If God were to cut my head off, I wouldn't have a problem with that. And then the next story in the Bible is the binding of Isaac story. Wow. Sort of Isaac opens his mouth and God says, you said it, let's test it. But that goes back to the essence of the rivalry. So Ishmael is a force to be reckoned with, but he maintains a dedication to God, which we see until today. And the Jewish interesting story, when Abraham dies, they reconcile. These brothers are, these half brothers have a lot of tension between them, but it's very interesting because every word in the Bible, there's a meaning here, the order of the words, everything, you know, this is the infinite author. His book has a lot of levels of understanding. It says when, 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 when Abraham dies, it says that Isaac and Ishmael bury him. And the order is important because Ishmael is the older one. Maybe Ishmael and Isaac should have buried their father, Abraham. And the rabbis say, so too in the end, when we finally, believe it or not, when all the smoke clears, the Jewish understanding is, is that Ishmael's descendants, the Arabs, the Islamic world, will line up behind the Jews. Because the other thing we have to recognize is that you cannot, as a Jew or a Muslim or a Christian, say about the other two faiths that you guys are right also. What's unique about Judaism is it's an exclusive worldview. In a world that was full of idols thousands of years ago and everyone's polytheist and swapping gods like, you know, doing trading on the stock market, Judaism is saying, no, you're all wrong. There's only one God. The two religions that come from us, which theologically and historically, which are Islam and Christianity, and actually Christianity appears first before Islam, are also uh, belief, belief systems that believe in only, there's only one right way here. 
Okay, they're, 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 you cannot, no Muslim's gonna say you Jews are also right. As a matter of fact, what Christianity said was God chose you and rejected you and you because re you rejected Jesus and then God chose us. And then the Muslims come along later and said the Jews got it wrong, the Christians got it wrong and we got it right, which is why Muhammad is viewed as the final prophet and everyone is supposed to submit to him, which is the very meaning of the word Islam, submission to the word of Allah, God, as transmitted through the prophet Muhammad. The difference between our worldviews is unlike those other faiths, which would basically tell you only by believing in their faith, are you going to get the reward up there in heaven? Judaism is the most inclusive of these exclusive faiths. And it says the righteous of the nations of the world have a place in the world to come. A non-Jew, you don't have to be Jewish to go to heaven. A non-Jew who accepts the seven Noahide laws, which are the seven laws that God gave to Noah after the flood, it's sort of like monotheism light. It's like Judaism stripped down. Uh, you get you get to go to the world to come. So we're actually quite inclusive, but these faiths are all exclusive. And there's a certain rivalry between all three of them because they realize that if I'm right, you can't be. And we're the least aggressive of all, all, all of those of the faiths also. Christianity believes in spiritual conquest of the world, but not on a theological level you know physically conquering the world it's not it's not a thing they do there's been plenty of christian rulers who have in the name of jesus have conquered a lot of stuff but it's not a commandment in christianity islam believes arguably more in the physical conquest of the world than the spiritual conquest of the world the idea of jihad of an external struggle to bring what is the, the world of the infidel into the uh, islam the house of islam is actually you know, they often call it the, the sixth pillar of Islam, even though it's not officially so. Judaism believes in, no, we do the right thing and everyone will just follow our lead. We make it hard to convert. And the only Jewish empire in history has been Hollywood. And that's not a source of Jewish values. So it's interesting. There's a very, a lot of stuff going on historically and theologically that creates this kind of crazy relationship and the rivalries and the tensions, which transcend all the modern geopolitical realities that are going on in the world today fascinating and yeah i mean look in many ways christianity and islam they sh share quite a lot of jewish ideas and principles and, and perhaps have been a good vehicle in one sense to share those ideas but it's true we do and do agree on the monotheism part but a big thing we disagree on is who this god is and what what he wants of us um i think that it's very notable that the islamic extremists talk about you know we celebrate death like the jews celebrate life and I, i've given this a lot of thought and it can't, it's not about the Jews are, let's say, scared of death. I mean, we have martyrs throughout our history. We've stared death in the face throughout our history. But it's really, the Islamic extremism is a, it's just an extreme manifestation of a religious view which is focused on heavenly rewards. And it's interesting when we talk about Alam Haba, we actually mean this world becoming, you know, us being resuscitated and brought back to life. Heaven is the temporary retirement home, but then we're trying to serve God here on earth to bring God down to earth rather than us get to heaven. So Judith, so the, the main sort of debate and disagreement is that w we celebrate life here as an end. Um, and uh, so it's, it's, it's very, uh, I suppose, heartwarming in a sense that, that Ishmael and, uh, well, yeah, Ishmael and, and uh, uh, Isaac, they, they seem to reconcile, right? So um, what, can you perhaps talk a bit about what is um, Ishmael's descendants? Who are they at their best? You know, what are the characters of Ishmael where they, they are best serving God? Because Rabbi Sachs in his um, book, Not in God's Name, he talks about how cho being chosen doesn't mean the other is rejected. We, you know, Judaism believes every nation has its role, its contribution in service of creating a godly world. Yeah, so that's, by the way, Maimonides' take on it. When I call it the two steps forward, one step back. Like I said, the two steps forward is that Christianity and Islam weaned much of the world off of amoral polytheistic worldview that so permeated the ancient world. The one step back is they think they've replaced us. Now, what Rabbi Sachs said is true that in, in the grand scheme of things, in the role of history, that's the role they play. But the end game is when I say reconcile, that doesn't mean when in the Jewish view of the messianic era, which Christianity and Islam both created, they got the concept from Judaism and had their own version, the Mahdi or the second coming of Jesus kind of thing that's in Christianity. Um, the Jewish worldview is not that when Mashiach comes, there's Islam and Christianity. No, there's only Jews. There's no conversion to Judaism afterwards because 
To be Jewish is you have to show you're dedicated to it. You want the pain for the gain, not when it's easy to do and everyone wants to join. Then the good, then it's then the, you can't do it anymore. Um, but the rest of the world, you can't. Again, it can't be that Muhammad's the prophet and Jesus is the Messiah. No, those those ideas, Judaism believes, will be shown to be essentially false because they, they can't be right. That's just a logical theological logical theological statement. Um, so. Uh, so uh, the whole world will become Noahides. They keep the seven laws of Noah. So ultimately, it's not that we conquer the world, we don't convert the world, but everyone, when I say Ishmael lines up behind, ultimately they recognize that we definitely have, look, Judaism would say Islam and Christianity are definitely closer to the truth than what came before them. But God gives the Torah to the Jewish people. He reveals themselves. We have a unique mission in the world. We're not chosen for a privilege. We're chosen for unique responsibility to be the connector, the people who connect humanity back to God. If we didn't, it's a counterfactual historical scenario that never happened. Had we weaned the world collectively off of idolatry and made them all Noahides, as we say, then it would, they wouldn't have had a need for Christianity or Islam. But mm. because one way or another, the world has to get back to relationship with God, that's the Jewish perspective, then Christianity and Islam step in to do the job, but we pay a huge price for it because, like I said before, they view themselves, their view is, is competition now. But ultimately, there won't be competition. There can't be. Can't be that these all that we're all right that's not the way it works and obviously just as a christian was is sure that rabbi spiro is wrong and that you know the imam muhammad is wrong over there so too the muslim is saying rabbi spiro is wrong and father patrick is also wrong so like i say we'll have we'll bring the messiah and then we'll know for sure but uh, they definitely the religions definitely have a role to play in the world the only thing i like to add which is interesting it's my own kind of observation is that both of these faiths that are offshoots of us historically and theologically have sides of them that are similar to us and further away from us the side of islam that is closer to judaism is their absolute you know very strict notion of god as an infinite invisible being there's no form there's no images he has no parts um and and islam does have commandments albeit five and they have and, and it functions in a legalistic way they have madrasim like a bait midras like a jewish study hall and they and they issue legal you know they issue regulations based on Islamic law and principles. So that's a similar thing to Judaism. Um, but this, but what they don't have is our Bible. They have the Quran, which which sort of references things in Judaism and the Bible and some biblical characters, but it's not. Christianity has a very different vision of God having parts, which is much more antithetical to the Jewish vision. But they have the Bible, which is the world's most impactful, transformative book, not just in the form, form of religion, but in the form of ethics, values, and politics. The Bible is the most transformative book. So to the extent that the Christian world has paid adherence to the Bible and taken it seriously is the extent that they, I believe, have behaved in, the, in their best possible form and have also become the biggest supporters of the Jewish people in Israel. That's something you don't necessarily see in the Islamic world because they lack the text of the Bible. Although there have been periods of time when Islam has been extremely open and tolerant and Christianity has not been. A thousand years ago, I would have, when ninety percent of the Jews in the world had their first language was Arabic, and they lived either in the Middle East or in Spain, I would have much rather been in that situation than being one of the few tens of thousands of Jews living in Europe under a very backward Christian world, which, by the way, banned the Bible as a book that you're not allowed to look at. <laughs> so, so it's been a so, roller coaster ride for us. So if if let's say the state of Israel hadn't been created. Um, it's possible you wouldn't see the same levels of Jewish hostility in the in the Arab world today, right? Um, so, it, but but I suppose part of the the insult is uh, that they feel about the state of Israel does come from a a place of ultimately anti-Jewish feeling, right? In some ways, it ignited it, right? Like, so I guess the question I'm sort of asking is like, to what extent um, ha, ha, have we sort of maybe made it made it worse the anti-semitism worse or was it always there and just be able to be brought out through through israel's creation so that's that's another really good question i mean the other thing this compares the christian attitude towards jews and the islamic attitude towards jews besides just we've replaced you or you got it wrong you know the, the the worst sin the jews ever did was were responsible for jesus's death and jesus is you know he's, he's the trinity he's the god's son so to speak 
and it, and because the Jew is the Jew is viewed literally as a physical threat to Christians. He poisons wells. He brings the Black Death to Europe. He's in league with the devil. The Jew and the devil conflate in medieval thinking, where the devil is portrayed with Jewish symbolism. So he's always viewed as that scary kind of guy in that way. In Islam, Muhammad interacts with a lot of Jews in, in the seventh century. And there's even wars, there's even battles between Jewish enclaves and his armies, which he always wins. So unlike Christianity, where the Jew is viewed as kind of a, a dangerous person, which explains the level of animus and violence directed at Jews in the Christian world, which is has no parallels in the Islamic world. Not that there hasn't been Islamic violence against Jews, but in the Islamic world, we lost the war. So the Jew is always portrayed in the Quran as being a wimp. He's physically not threatening, but he's smart and he's deceptive. So by the way, and so that's number one. So Jews winning wars starting in 48, especially 67, was a big shock to the Arab world. But more than that, and this is the thing that no one wants to talk about because you can't because of everyone's so politically correct. You have to understand what I'm going to say now is basic Islamic worldview. This is not radical Islamic worldview. How it's interpreted and applied, of course, is a different subject. But basic Islamic worldview is Jews got it wrong. Christians got it wrong. Muhammad got it right. He's the final prophet. No one comes after him. The whole world is supposed to submit to him, which is what being a Muslim is, submitting to the word of God. The whole world is supposed to become one giant ummah, one giant Islamic world, one giant dar at Islam. That is, they got from us this deterministic worldview. We Jews believe God acts in history and is steering all of humanity with the Jewish people at the helm towards a certain destination of relationship with God and creating an ideal world. Islam has a similar concept where the whole world finally submits to you know, the word of God transmitted through Muhammad. But until we reach that phase, the world will be divided into two parts. One is called Dar al-Islam, the world of Islam, the house of Islam. And what is called Dar al-Kharab, which is the word for sword, the world of war, the world of the infidel. And Islam being a legalistic faith has definitions for different kinds of non-Muslims. There's pagans. Jews are not considered pagans, nor are Christians. They have no future in Islam. They have to convert, become a slave, or die. But then there's that word dhimmi, D-H-I-M-M-I which is a protected people, which sounds nice, but it really is Islamic apartheid. Because you believe in one God, we don't kill you. But because you're not a Muslim, you're subjected to any number of discriminatory legislations, which, by the way, is still technically a part of Islam, although not kept in most Islamic states anymore. But you have to pay special taxes. You know, you have to step into the gutter when a Muslim walks by. You can't be on an animal and be higher than the Muslim. You can't testify in court against them. You can't employ them as servants. You can't bear arms in the presence of a Muslim. If your synagogue or your church is allowed to be built, it has to be built subterranean or semi-subterranean to show its inferiority to Islam. And you have to always be under the thumb of Islam. You have to know your place. So, and of course, a, a dhimmi is never, and that which becomes Islamic from their deterministic deterministic worldview, which was Israel, by the way, from the seventh century until the British showed up in the end of 1917, is not from their worldview ever allowed to going back to being non-Islamic. Dar al-Islam al cannot go back to Dar al-Kharab. That happened with the British reconquering the land, but even worse than that, because the Turks had it last, they were Muslims. But then that the Jew, the Dhimmi, creates a state in what is the heart of the Islamic Middle East. And not only that, now he rules over, I'm not talking about the territories, I'm talking about 20% of Israel's population are Israeli Arabs who are citizens. They're not living up on some security barrier on the other side. This is from a theological level, the very existence of the state of Israel from a theological level is unacceptable. It goes against their understanding of the plot of the story. Just as the survival of the Jew was shocking to the Christian world, which is why, you know, how can they reestablish? It took till Pope John Paul in the year 2000 to, to reconcile the existence of a Jewish state. God rejected you guys. How come you're still here? Oh, you got a, a few of you have to survive to testify when Jesus comes again that he's the Messiah. But did you get your state back from Christian theology for 2000 years? You lost your state because you rejected God and God rejected you and exiled you. So only when you get, only when Christianity and the Catholic Church I'm talking about now, is able to reconcile the notion that there's a place for Jews in the world and replacement theology has to be pushed aside is no longer publicly espoused by the church. Do they make room to coexist with us and establish diplomatic relations with us, which only happened 23 years ago? The Islamic world, some of it has like UAE and stuff. They've definitely. Right. So, so what's, how do you, how do you, how have they reconciled that with this theology you've spoken about? 
because we know that you have, there's the way, like they say, there's the way it is and the way it ought to be. Maybe they're thinking in the back of their mind, really, that's the way it is. We'll eventually get back to that. But in the meantime, we're just going to be practical and we don't have to take the extreme. When you get to organizations like ISIS, like Hamas, like Hezbollah, which are fanatical organizations that have in their charter, Hamas's charter calls for the destruction of the state of Israel and the death of Jews. And they, they love to quote the Hadith. The Hadith is like, is like stories about the life and actions of Muhammad that are, are authoritative legally and use, and use the sources. The famous one about, and the day of redemption will not come until Muslims make war against the Jews and kill them. And a Jew hiding behind a tree or a rock, the tree or a rock will say, O Muslim, O servant of Allah, there is a Jew hiding behind me, come and kill him. Notice, by the way, it doesn't say, O Palestinian, it doesn't say, O Israeli. This is viewed, this is the biggest mistake we make is somehow view this as some sort of geopolitical conflict that has nothing to do with any of that. We offered the Palestinians multiple times, including Gaza in 2005. Here, make a little country there. Uh -uh. They militarize and use it as a launching place to try and destroy us. 2000, 2007, the Israeli government offered to return to the pre-67 six-day war. Armistice lines, the Arab, the, the Palestinians rejected. It's always been about the Arab world's inability to accept a Jewish state of any size. And that is largely based on Islamic worldview. And until that kind of chills out and becomes a little more normal and inclusive, like you're seeing in some Arab states, like in UAE, you can't make peace with these people because their theology makes it impossible for them to live in peace with us. Yeah. It's interesting um, because I was having a, a talk with a friend of mine um, on Shabbat and, you know, we we're talking about some of the world's reaction, you know, 100,000 protesters in London. I mean, I don't even know what they're protesting about, you know, it, like it's literally the day after the, uh, the, the, the Hamas attack, you know, it was a celebration basically. Um, meanwhile, you have hundreds of thousands of, of Arabs slaughtered in other Arab countries, you know, in Syria, more so than throughout the whole Arab-Israeli conflict uh, since 1948, and they're not interested. And, uh, you know, we've seen anti-Semitic incidents occur across the world and some of the great institutions around the world, universities, celebrity culture, sports culture, the press, being so hostile. And, you know, I know this may sound odd to some people, but like, you know, my, my friend said, like, it's only been, it's only 75 years since the Holocaust. And I, this, this is sort of like a gallows humor. We both just started laughing. Like, it was like a nervous laughter. It was like, <laughs> it's just, it's ridiculous. It's insane. Like, you know, people spoke about how maybe we're concerned in one generation after Holocaust survivors die, maybe two generations. What's going to happen then? Will the world forget? They're still alive. <laughs> They're still around, and, and we look at look at what's happening in in the world today. Um, but then again, on the other hand, it does seem like among polling, and certainly in some Western countries like America, the major the silent majority, or maybe not so silent in some cases, do stand with Israel. So you know what we were discussing was like, do you do you think the world has grown up at all in these last seventy five years? Are there any signs that we're we're, we're starting to grow up? I mean, again, there's there's two steps forward, one step back. Parts of the world have, for sure, like I said, the like the the, the Christian right in America. Not all of them, but to a large extent, because they're so now Bible based. This is a post World War II phenomenon. The born again Christian, they're the biggest supporters of Israel, and they're most into the Bible, and they love it. They just see this is the source of everything. The Hebrew Bible, by the way, not so mm -hmm. much. They, they know they're Christian Bible, but they really see the Hebrew Bible as the original source. But on the other hand, the world has lost the plot. The, the you know the there's Will Hilbert, who is an American Jewish sociologist from the mid 20th century, had this cut flower ethics idea, which is a brilliant idea. He said cut flowers when put in a vase, you know, they look nice for a week, but after, because they're severed from their roots, they wither and die. He says so too with the, with the moral, spiritual roots of Judeo-Christian ethics, which come from the Bible. Once they're once they lose their connection to the religion, they morph into it's almost a cancerous thing you've got growing, which ironically everyone associates, you know, anti-Semitism, racism with the right. But the reality is where it's coming from on a much larger level is the political left, which is gets a lot of its ideology, at least in phraseology, from liberal democratic principles, but because it's lacking its basis in the absolute clear morality of the Bible, it is actually metastasized, and I use that word deliberately, into something that 
is actually antithetical to Judaism. So you now have this crazy, what we call the red green alliance of the radical Islamists on university campuses in America. You see this in the rallies in the street with the, with the liberal left and the intersectionality that Israel is just the last vestigial aspect of Western, you know, colonialism, white foreigners, you know, dominating and slaughtering, committing a genocide against the indigenous Palestinian population. Every bit of that narrative is a complete lie and wrong. So, you know, we're not going to hold class on ripping that to shreds. The reality is, in many ways, we are stepping backwards. I see a good chunk of the world is in a much worse state than it was in the 1930s. Evil reared its ugly head in the worst way we thought in the 1930s. Um, but there was no equivocating on who was right and who was wrong during World War II. December 8th, 1941, which is the day after Pearl Harbor with the Japanese sneak attack, there was no parades pro-Japanese parades in America. We called evil, evil, good, good, and bad, bad. And the stupidity and insanity of these people screaming in the streets. I understand, you know, why people from the Middle East, okay, they're passionate. This is their cousins. But that these Euro and American university student leftist people screaming from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free, which is the joy. By the way, if I were to stop on the street and ask what that means, they'd have no idea. They don't even know where yeah. Israel is. They never been there. You know nothing about it. But that is calling for the destruction of the state of Israel. Were I to show them the charter of Hamas, that's that's the people who got the only reason we're Gaza is the way it is. In World War II, the Allies ended up carpet bombing cities in Germany and Hamburg and Dresden, and no one was protesting in the streets. There's an idea of collective responsibility for the governments that you allow to be into power. Israel, by the way, opposite opera, we're the only country in the world that doesn't do this. If this was Russia, they would be carpet bombing Gaza. We're going to lose a lot of soldiers, unfortunately, God forbid, because we're not going to do that because we're going to go in house to house to minimize civilian casualties. But the incomplete inability, the, the, the ambiguity that's in people's brains now because they're so lacking in information and so and so like connected to an ideology, which is almost a religious faith based system of intersectionality and wokeism has completely blinded a good chunk of the world to reality and truth. And that's what the real struggle is about today. Who is going to live in reality and truth, regardless of how it shakes up what you want to be true or your belief system, even if it's a non-religious belief system, my belief system about the world. And who's going to live with that? Who's going to live with that? And who's going to deny it and continue to live in the world of lies and untruths and, and lend support, if not directly involved in the evil, lend the support to the evil. And that's what's really going on. So in many ways, I think we're in a much worse state than we were precisely because a good chunk of that world has moved away. On the other hand, you can see that there's some really good friends of Israel and they're overwhelmingly people who are overwhelmingly. You see people who are conservative politically and often and religious because they believe in a God and an absolute standard of morality and another Bible and another God gave the land of Israel to the Jewish people. Mm -hmm. I want you to talk a bit about the importance of Jewish unity, especially looking at the wider context of Jewish history and how there's a danger whenever we are disunited. And we've seen over the last year, basically Israel really having some serious infighting over some democratic principle. And, and you know, we've just suffered the, the worst attack on our people since, since the Shoah. Um, Disunity is seen as exceptionally dangerous. Could you talk a bit about that from a historical perspective and also like about what's been going on in Israel recently and, the, and what we need to do? Well, for sure, disunity. Unity is a huge thing. Um, and disunity is viewed very, very badly by the, the Bible makes it very clear that the problem is Jewish people because our greatest strength is our very rugged individualism. That Jews are very independent independent, stiff-necked people. That's actually a line used from the Bible in the book of Exodus, Am Kishi Oref, um, which is a, necess a necessary trait to stand up to the great empires of the world, to outlast them, to be willing to die for our beliefs and to change the world in ways that are so profound that very few people realize how much of the basic software operating spiritual moral fabric of Western, of the, of the consciousness of the world comes from Judaism requires a very stiff-necked People, but it also makes a people that is extremely hard to unify and lead. I always say from a historical perspective, the hardest job in the world is to lead the Jewish people. It's easier to be the emperor of a billion Chinese and the mayor of a town of a hundred Jews. And I'm not saying anything bad about Chinese people here. So it's a strength and a weakness, but this unity 
always is our big Achilles heel. When we are united, we are an unstoppable force in history. When we are divided, and often some of the biggest tragedies that hit us are taking place as we're fighting amongst ourselves. When the Romans were surrounding Jerusalem and ready to destroy the second temple, the Jews inside the city are fighting a civil war. You know, when the Persians during the, the Purim story, when, when uh, you know, when, when we're threatened with a genocide going back 20, you know, about 2,400 years ago under Haman, the, sto- the famous Purim story, you know, the way he sells it, uh, you know, Haman, our arch enemy sells it to the emperor of Persia. There's a nation scattered everywhere, you know, they're kind of all over the place, meaning they're not only physically in the same place, but they're not even holding in the same place. It's interesting when the salvation comes in the narrative, the first thing that Mordechai, who is the one of the spiritual rabbinic leaders of the Jewish people who leads to the salvation from that potential genocide story, he says, go gather Jewish people together. Lech no sayudim. Put us together. We stand at Mount Sinai. We got the Torah. The language is used in the singular. The people camped in the singular in Hebrew. And so we see that the God is always telling us from our perspective that you are one family. You can agree to disagree, but you cannot fight amongst each other. Now, I have noticed from as a historian, and I've been in Israel for 40 years, that most of the big threats externally, the first intifada, second intifada, this war now, I saw it coming. I've been saying it. You could find me online saying it for months, are all preceded by infighting amongst the Jewish people. And the worst infighting that took place in Israel since I've been here is what was taking place in the state, dealing with the left-right political split in Israel, primarily focused on the issue of judicial reform and the power of the Supreme Court. It was out of control bad. And I, I say this all the time. It's like God saying, my children, if you want to kill each other, I can't stand to watch. I'm going to send non-Jews to do it. And I knew something was going to happen. I just had no idea it was going to be this bad. So clearly we, we crossed the line in a really bad way. But what you also see, by the way, not to be totally negative, is when we're being attacked, then we stop fighting and we come together. And the unity you see in the country today is insane. There are thousands of yeshiva guys who normally don't want to go to the army signing up to go to the army. Like they're, they're pouring in by several thousand of them want to be drafted. This is a whole big thing in Israel. We don't want them any of these guys drafted. There's everyone is putting their differences aside and realizing that, like I always say, in Auschwitz, there's only one line. The people who hate us don't care about what we believe religiously, reform, conservative, orthodox, whether we're liberal or conservative, Republican or Democrat. They all look at us as Jews. We have to learn to look at ourselves as Jews, which doesn't mean we have to agree on everything. It would be great if we did, but it's never going to happen. But can, like can I always I say, anyone. Yeah. Go on, go on, finish, finish what you're going to say. Any parent gets the line. I always say, you don't always, you don't always like your kids, but you always love them. Otherwise, you wouldn't let them live through being teenagers. When we're dealing with our fellow Jews, we have to recognize that you're. My, I don't agree with you, but you're my brother, you're my sister. I got to show some respect for you, and I got to love you. We can agree to disagree. The, the problem is, I, I suspect most Jewish people listening to this would agree with what you're saying. But let's just rewind back a few months. So, what practically? How should things have looked differently when we were having this debate over, over you know, a democratic issue? Well, what we, what we needed that we didn't get was someone who was, that's the leadership issue. If there was a political leader who knew how to be in the center, that's the problem is Israel is very extremist on both sides. Netanyahu's government is very, it's a lot of what we'd call in terms of nationalism and religion, a lot of that in the government, which is very scary to the left in the country. And then there's people on the left who are just freaking out about all this because they're now demographically, possibly permanently out of power. So they know that, you know, that's the way the country's working, just pure demographics of who's having the babies and and how those children are going to be politically affiliated. So if there was someone who could have stood up in the middle and as a role model for someone who's in the middle, knows how to speak to both sides of the aisle, so to speak, as we say, and 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 give and give forth a vision of unity which is the biggest tent possible that would have done it the problem is finding such a person is not easy we're kind of scraping the barrel in terms of role models for leadership and everyone is so politicized and no one is standing back and looking at the greater good of the country as a whole and that's what we're lacking but if it doesn't come from the top down at least come from the bottom up and recognize that we have to have civil discourse. we have to have civil discourse like I said, we can agree to disagree, but there are limits beyond which you can go. And we cannot get let it get to the point where, because one of the reasons on a purely geopolitical level that they may have seized on the opportunity to attack us now is thinking that we're weak and divided. And, you know, like Abraham Lincoln said, a house divided against itself cannot stand. Yeah. And we are an unstoppable force when we're unified, when we are divided, it's, it's unbelievably bad. 
Yeah, and I think I was about to say exactly what you said, that vision that you have for a, you know, a, a good ideal Jewish leader. We, sh we should all try to, to embody that. Um, okay, two, two last questions. I've been talking about this. Um, it's, it started in private discussions about a year ago and then started to ask people this more publicly on, on JTV. Is it time that we as a Jewish people need to start telling the world not that you know we won we got israel because of international law and the united nations we have a right to self determination self haven sorry safe haven uh we are indigenous we have a long historical connection there all being true and compelling but is it time especially with the arab world who are religious we should declare with confidence that the creator of the world decreed this land belongs to the jewish people do we need to start saying that more clearly and is 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 that what god wants us to do um ideally if 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 the whole if the if the entire state of israel were like this religious state you could you might be able to do that that resonates by the way that argument resonates with the right, the evangelical christian community and even with some muslims by the way i've heard some muslims online a few that are brave enough to say it say it it actually well by the way jerusalem is not mentioned anywhere in the quran and there's no source in the quran giving the land of israel to to muslims chapter 5 the table verse 21 of the quran which is the that chapter deals with the Jewish people's history in the land of Israel. It says, enter my holy people and inherit the land God has given you. So there is actually a Quranic source, which they never mention, of course. Um, but, you know, that we can make that argument, I don't know. But I don't think it's a, I don't think it's a zero sum game. Either we make the modern political, you know, League of Nations, you know, partition vote and whatever. Or, but we need to, but we can make an argument, which is the argument made by Ben Gurion, by the way. David Ben Gurion was the first uh, prime minister of Israel, who was very far from being religious, but he knew his Bible and and his history very well. When he was dragged in front of the Peel Partition uh, Committee, which was a British attempt to try and figure out how to deal with the Arab uprising that began in thirty six, how are we going to like take what's left of the territory that we're supposed to give to the Jews already, which is 75% they gave to create a country called Jordan. What do you do that last 25%? So they slept Ben Gurion and France. ask, where is your document, your firman, your, it's in a, like an Arabic word, where's your document of ownership for the land? What's your claim gonna be? Ben Gurion, the socialist, non-religious, holds up a Hebrew Bible and he says, you know, the right to the land of Israel is not derived from the Balfour Declaration or the British Mandate, which are the two major statements of the British government supporting a Jewish state. Uh, the, it comes from the Bible written by the Jewish people in the land of Israel. Thousands of years ago, the right to the land of Israel is as old as the Bible itself. And that is an argument that's somewhere in the middle because you're not making a God gave us the land of Israel argument, but you are making an argument which upslugs the big lie, which is undermining the Jewish claim today, which is all the intersectional crazy woke left is shrieking about like we already mentioned, that the Jews are white foreigners. No, I may have lost my melanin, but my my haplotype is Middle Eastern. We this, The Jewish history in the land of Israel goes back thousands and thousands of years. Joshua brought the Jews in 1900 years before Muhammad, you know, the descendant of Muhammad, Omar ibn al-Khattab, the second caliph, brought Arab armies into what is today Israel. So, you know, the fact that we're willing to share the land with people whose claim is far newer and far less central than ours, even our holiest religious site, is pretty unbelievable. No other people in the world would do that. The Pope doesn't give over the Vatican to the rabbis to use for the breakaway minyan on Yom Kippur, and the Muslims don't give away Mecca for Jews to use on our high holidays in Sukkot. So the, to make an argument which is based not necessarily on the God-given argument, but, but getting really trying to make set the book straight on the history of Jerusalem, our connection to it, the history of Jewish people's connection as a people, because we're a people and a faith, our, our, our historical, our national, and our spiritual connection to the land of Israel is something we have to keep repeating over and over again and not making it too complicated. But we are a nation. We're not some foreign white people from Poland. We only came from, I only came from Poland because I was exiled from my land, but I never gave up one and there was always Jews living in it and yada, yada, yada. But say it over and over again. The fact that many Jews don't even know that is a scary part of all of that. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so lastly, you have a uh, talk about anti-Semitism and the cause also being the cure. Can, can we finish on that point? Yes, yeah, so, you know, that's another, another small little topic there. But, you know, I always say, to sum it up quickly, we've been accused of a lot of things in history. 
you know, we, we, we killed God's son. We, we kidnapped Christian babies, used their blood to bake matzo. We poison wells. We're in league with the devil. We control the world's economy, seismic flares, we tr uh, solar flares. We trigger tsunamis in Southeast Asia to drown Indonesia with tidal waves, release sharks into the Red Sea to destroy Egyptian tourism. We send vultures to spy on Saudi Arabia. We stole Iran's cloud cover. We have a space laser, and now we're harvesting Palestinian organs from dead babies and, and, and committing a genocide against them. Now, people may believe these things, but they're all a smokescreen. Bottom line is, and this goes really to the essence of what the land of Israel and the Jewish people are about. The bottom line is, is our national historic mission from Abraham onward is we have been dragging the world often very painfully and for thousands of years, kicking and screaming towards a vision of values based on one God and one absolute standard of morality, which is the most transformative idea in all of human history, ethical monotheism and anti-Semitism. Ultimately, even subliminally and subconsciously, what it's always about is a rebellion against the national historic mission of the Jewish people to bring the world to those values. And the extent that people buy into them, like the Christian community that takes the Bible seriously, they will get behind us and support us to the extent that people in the words of the late great Lord Rabbi Dr. Jonathan Sachs would say, not in God's name in his book, people could pay lip service to God, but what, like what Hamas is doing is giving God a very bad name. So they might be screaming every time they're killing Jews, Allahu Akbar, God is great, God is crying, because you're just using my name, but you won't got my book. And that's exactly what's going on. So the only solution to anti-Semitism ultimately is to have Jews for Judaism, which is who make great role models for the world, and to create a Jewish state it's not a theocracy, you know, with the, you know, you know, we get discussions on biblical law and how it should be applied in a modern state, but a Jewish state that embodies Jewish values. And by the way, even the secular democratic state of Israel largely does embody in many ways, Jewish values, the way Israel behaves as a light to the world and all of its startup and that we sharing it with the world and helping everyone and the way we behave in warfare and you name it, it is what we call a Kiddush Hashem. Our job is to live and act in a way that inspires the world. And when we do that, like I said, going back to what we started with, when we finally get our act together, the world will eventually line up behind us and say, hey, you seem to do it better than anyone else. I always quote that line that we all know imitation is the highest form of flattery. When someone copies you, even though they're not paying you royalties, there's still it's flattery. You did it right. I always tell people that's the shortest class you ever got on Christianity and Islam. If it wasn't for us doing it right, even when we we're in exile and being persecuted, still creating communities and a lifestyle and a vision for humanity and values that were just much better, they would never have followed us. Now they're just saying, you're basically right, but we replaced you. But that's, like I said, two steps forward and one step back. And that's our mission. That's what we have to keep our eye on the ball to recognize that just counteracting all the slanderous accusations leveled against us is only a stopgap measure. We have to treat the real disease. And that is the lack of the world ultimately buying into the Judeo-Christian ethics, as we call them, but the values that the creator of the universe gave us, which is the ultimate perfect blueprint for humanity. Amazing. Uh, Rabbi Kensbury, thank you so much for your time, uh, for, for shedding so much light on this, this uh, you know, these contemporary issues. Um, you should check out uh, Rabbi Ken Spiro's books. They're brilliant. They talk about a lot of these things that we've been talking about over the past hour in a lot more detail. There's the Crash Course in Jewish History. There's World Perfect, which is about the Ju Ju Judaism's impact on world civilization and world values. Um, there's Destiny, which is about Jewish history um, in sort of a, a broader aerial uh, vision. Um, are there any other ones I've missed out? Well, I, that's the books. I have a website, kenspiro.com, with a lot of content on it that's available for free to listen, read, and watch. But the thing that people, I really need to tell more people about, I do a blog almost every week. It's called Remember What's Next. It's on Spotify, Anchor, Google, Apple. And it's about current events and Jewish history and the convergence between them, what we learn from them and what's going on. And uh, it's, a, it's a good way of combining the two, the Jewish worldview with what's going on and where we're going. Great. Well, we'll put a link in the video description on YouTube uh, so people can check that out. Um, stay safe and uh, we look forward to hearing, hearing good news. Amen. Pleasure to Thanks be here. Lot, Rabbi.